Welcome, viewers and listeners, to the Health Revolution, the program that shows you how to have a life of vibrant well being. In a world full of noisy health trends, we bring you clarity. In a sea of fads, we reveal the science backed strategies that truly work. We explore physical strength, emotional resilience, and mental mastery. These are the keys to an enriched life. Join us for inspiring interviews with champions who conquered life's health challenges fueling your journey. Are you ready to unlock your potential to live with vitality and purpose? Then join the health revolution. I'm your host, Adriana Morrison, health and fitness expert, speaker, and a mom who understands. Let's embark on this transformative quest. Together, we're about to change the game starting now. The information provided in this show is intended for educational and entertainment purposes only. Viewers should use their own discretion and consult with a healthcare professional for personalized guidance and recommendations. The following program contains mature situations and themes and is intended for an adult audience and may not be suitable for younger viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome everybody to the Health Revolution. We are excited that you are joining us today. I'm your host, Adriana Morrison. And don't forget that no matter which way you're tuning in to us, don't forget to hit the subscribe button because we want to stay connected to you. And of course, as all things fall underneath the umbrella of health and wellness, we're talking the physical, the emotional, and the mental mastery, optimizing our lives in spite of any twists and turns along the way. Today's show topic is extremely important for many reasons. One, we can all learn from. Two, tapping into resources and support. Today we are talking about sexual violence and healing from a situation of sexual violence and what it means for support for those who who have experienced sexual violence and uh, or those that we, if we have been a victim ourselves. My guest today is someone who has spent a, an extensive amount of time uh, working through this very careful area that we all need to be aware of, but definitely brings the, the knowledge and, and the tools and resources that are important for us all to know. So take a look at this. Would love for you to get to know him. Check this out. Meet Robert Utaro a dedicated rape crisis counselor and community educator in his 15th year of service. With a foundation in criminal justice studies, Bobby has devoted his life to advocacy and support for survivors of sexual violence. As a counselor, he provides comprehensive support to survivors and their loved ones, addressing mental, emotional, spiritual, and legal challenges. Bobby's commitment extends beyond counseling, as he facilitates workshops aimed at educating communities about the realities of sexual violence, offering strategies for support, prevention, and healing. Bobby's work has not gone unnoticed. He's been featured in magazines across the country and on international radio broadcasts. He has written a powerful book, To the Survivors, and it has touched minds and hearts globally, furthering his mission to bring light to the darkness of sexual violence. Guided by his faith, Bobby Utaro continues to make a profound impact in the lives of survivors and in the fight against sexual violence. Bobby Utaro, welcome to the show. Excited to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So this is a, a, a journey that is uh that has challenges and i'm curious how how did you find yourself to to become and have the role that you do uh being a sense of resource and support community educator rape rape crisis counselor uh what led you to truly embrace this very careful role that you have i didn't actually seek it out i i was called to it um this isn't about religion but i was called by God for a lifelong calling. Um, I was a senior in college and I was taking, uh, a, as you mentioned earlier, a criminal justice major. We were taking a class on women in crime. And we were talking about female inmates and um, female gang members. And there was a big section on the class that had to do with rape. And it was just hitting me very deeply. It was, it was, it, it, I was deeply moved. And 
women from a rape crisis count, uh, center came into my class and they made a presentation. And I was just in awe of these women. I mean, they were like angels to me. They were just so strong and yet gentle and peaceful. Um, and I was in awe of what they did, that they did this full time. And they showed us a reenactment of a perpetrator. And that made me disturbingly angry. I, it was a rage that made me quite scared of myself. And then that rage turned into a deep disgust where I thought I was gonna throw up in my chair. And I felt the calling and I really felt God say, will you help? And when that happened, so much negativity came at me. Um, and I knew that I was called in this way. I knew that I could, that I was supposed to do something. And the women asked us if we were interested in possibly volunteering. Um, as scared as I was, as insecure as I was, I just went up to them after class. I asked them if I could volunteer. They uh, took down my information. I ended up uh, being chosen over some other people and uh, my life's never been the same since. So I've been doing this work uh, throughout my life ever since that moment. What were some things that surprised you that you learned that first you know, experiencing what they were recounting, what they were sharing? What was that, what were some things that really hit you home that that you never that it never occurred before so for as long as i can remember i've known human beings can do very bad things to each other we can uh we can be incredible to each other and commit horrors to each other i didn't know how deep this, these crimes really can run and how long that you're seeing how so many people so many women so many men can be affected for many 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 years even a lifetime from just one act of sexual trauma. And that breaks my heart, actually. And, you know, it also showed me and taught me, it made me be a, a better person, more gentle, more compassionate. It helped me to be a better listener. And and one thing that really struck me was we were, I was with a woman and I remember she was talking to this woman on the phone. I, we weren't seeing each other, we weren't in person. And she said to the woman, do you mind if a male is on this call with us? And that really hit me because I wasn't talking and the, it showed me how sensitive this really is to be able to ask that woman to ask her permission, her consent, if I could simply just listen in on the call. Um, and when that happened, I said, wow, this is this is really real. You know, we're really doing this. And uh, that was that was that was very important to me to learn. How have you integrated what you've learned with the criminal studying criminal justice studies? and what you are learning in terms of sexual violence, sexual trauma, the realities behind it, and what we face as a society. What were you, how were you witnessing the two integrate together? Do they automatically go hand in hand? Are there issues that come up as trends that maybe the rest of us don't know about? Or what's, what are some things that really strike you of those two coming together? Well, there are connections to many aspects of our life. And so one of them is simply the prison system. So if we look at, I once had a meeting with women in a, in a, in a female prison and the director of uh, women's services told me that 75% of the women incarcerated were sexually abused. And the director of mental health services said, no, 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 it's 99%. And so it was showing us, showing me that the, again, the deep trauma of sexual abuse connected to some of our uh, inmate population. And many of them are addicted to drugs. Uh, some of the women that we were working with were actually prostitutes. And so that's part of it. Then just seeing, just in my day-to-day -day life, just even working, meeting people, you know, meeting people that you would have no idea um, how depressed they are. You'd have no idea. Uh, that they might be cutting themselves. You have no idea that they want to die. You have no idea what they have experienced in their life and how that has played a role in their own self worth, sense of self confidence, and even the choices they make could be even the people they date or marry. Um, so there's many connections in the criminal justice system, but also just in daily life. If you look at sometimes we see a kid or even an adult and how many of us are checking in with them? If we notice a change in their behavior, it could be a change even of, of clothing or hairstyle, something that oftentimes can be quite extreme and just say, hey, what's going on? Or, oh, wow, I love your hair. Just acknowledging that change sometimes can be a huge uh, life-changing moment for that person. Do you notice a trend 
as you talk with those who are really struggling to overcome the sexual violence and trauma, do you notice any trends in terms of struggling and, and processing and uh, maybe what the level of support around them has mm -hmm. always been? Is there a difference in that? It's important to know that people are similar and yet we're all different too. And so there's, there's people that it can affect people differently. So, you know, what someone else's experience is not someone else's experience, right? But in my experience doing this for so long, I have seen a pattern, a combination, uh, a, a commonality of shame. Uh, to me, there's people who are people that struggle with eating disorders and many people who are sexually abused do not struggle with eating disorders. There are many people uh, that I've met people that, um, you know, are not or cannot get in healthy relationships and other people that are married and, and they're totally fine and have raised their families. Right. Um, but something that is common is shame, which is so sad to me because that implies that they are like dirty and wrong and they've done something wrong, but in reality they haven't. It's what someone else has done to them, but it infects people. It infects people with this deep, dark shame. And also just the commonality of isolation or just not even speaking about it. So many people that we, that we see, sometimes people we know um, are struggling or even suffering in silence. And they possibly don't know how to bring it up, don't want to bring it up, or don't know who to bring it up to, or how to express it, you know, in different ways. So I would say people are different and it affects people differently, but shame, and it's just a very difficult thing to talk about. You mentioned that in the very beginning, you found yourself as, you know, as nervous as you were, but raising your hand and saying, I'd like to step forward and I'd like to, you know, be a part of this journey and help others who have gone through this. Mm -hmm. uh, what were some of your professional breakthroughs that you that you experienced along the way as you've grown your voice mm -hmm. and you've gained the experience to be to to show that support? I mean, I, I hate my voice. I think I sound terrible. So it, it was like to be able to, you know, when I first started doing this, it was it was like anything I could do to help. And that meant cleaning the toilets. That meant making copies for people. That meant it could be counseling. It was whatever they needed. If I could be assistance, I would do it. It didn't matter to me how it came. I never once thought I would speak. Never once thought I'd become an educator. Never once thought I'd become a teacher, let alone have this interview with, with you now 15 years later, right? So one of my personal professional uh, accomplishments was being able to use my voice, was being able to speak, and then seeing how important that was to other people. Seeing, I've been in, I've been in colleges, I've been many different places, and I remember sometimes we'd walk in and there'd be like a room full of women, and they were so excited for us to be there, which is almost sad because it's such a horrific topic. I mean, this is not, you know, the the conversation you normally might have on the beach on a vacation. Do you know what I mean? So. But that was exciting. So you knew it was really impacting people. Um, and and I'm, I'm still doing it. I'm still learning things along the way. I'm still wanting to be the most effective if I can and, and the most just to be patient and gentle. I'm not always the most patient human being. I'm not always the most, you know, the calmest all the time. But with this work, you have to be. You have to be. You have to really give of yourself to someone in need and to put their needs before yours and to meet them where they're at. And I think that's helped me in other aspects of life. There are so many people, many people do not know what I do. They do not, you know, I work in schools. I don't go up to fifth grade and be like, Hey, like, let's talk about sexual violence. I don't do that. Right. They have no idea, but learning what I've learned in rape crisis counseling and education has helped me to be an educator and even better um, with kids, adults, um, and just issues that arise. Does that make sense? It does. Where has there been the greatest need for this to be addressed? What population you talked about, you know, the, the prison systems and where that, you know, the voices that that were sharing the experience. And in these 15 years, where have you noticed that the greatest need to have this conversation lies? That's a phenomenal question um, to me. It is a global problem. It is it is in rich communities. It is in poor communities. It is in 
India, Thailand, it's in the United States. It's it's everywhere. And I, it's hard to say which one needs it the most because I would argue that every community needs it. And uh, there are you know many places of worship that don't have these conversations. There are many schools that do not have these conversations. There are many, uh, I think it should be, we should be having parent conferences and, and talking to parents about these kinds of things. So many people say, you know, so many women are abused and it's true. There are men who are abused too. Our little boys, there are many boys who are being abused. There's this people, it affects people and every background, any gender, any identity, any socioeconomic status. But if I had to say, where's the biggest need? Yes, there are more girls and women who are being hurt, who are being raped, who are being sexually abused. And that is having a deep impact in their lives, the lives of their loved ones in this world. So we, why, why are we doing this? What are we doing about it? And how are we helping those who are affected? Even if we don't even know, even if we don't know, but how are we treating people? That is part of my work of trying to help people to respond to it, treat people better and to help people down a path of healing uh, versus a path of destruction. Where are you discovering that there is pushback? Say for example, you know, having this conversation in areas you talked about schools you talked about churches and then obviously in the prison system where it's come up mm -hmm. uh for the times that you've gotten the hesitation maybe the uh ooh, maybe this is not you know not quite sure how this conversation would roll what um where is the concern if you get it that introducing this conversation that that their that their concern comes up the same places i'm talking about I mean, you know, there's been schools that accept it, schools that don't. There's churches that accept it, churches that don't. There's libraries that accept it, libraries that don't. Um, there are some parents who, there are some people who just the word rape is so difficult to hear, let alone say, let alone have like a, a conversation about, which I understand. I totally understand it. But if it's affecting your kids or, you know, or it could affect your children, this is something I would argue it's necessary. I'd argue it's vital. I wish it wasn't, but... I argue it is. Um, so there's pushback. There's a ton of pushback from colleges or not even pushback, just not. Um, there, there are schools who do great work and do things with this. If you're asking for myself personally, that no, the, there's been pushbacks in every institution I've been at and success at every time I've tried. So there's, it's a mixed bag. It's quite, it's, it's interesting actually. Do you think that in your opinion, do you think that maybe some of that is fear that oh, if we if we introduce this conversation that it's going to uh, unlock new you know new areas of concern that maybe it's going to lead to things that'll be uh, more issues or what what have you been hearing? I think you're right. I think fear is is to me fear is one of the most powerful forces on the earth. So there are people who. Uh, there are people who are scared that we'll do this. They, there are people who they're abusing their own kids. So why would they ever want someone like me or a Christ center come in and talk to their kids about these issues when they're actually abusing their own kids? There are, um, there are people that go, this, this, this doesn't happen here. What are you, what are you talking about? And it's like, no, it does. In fact, let me tell you about what someone just said to me recently or what kids are hearing from other people. Why are, why do I have young people even bringing up the term rape? But I do. Um, I had a kid threaten to rape a girl and he might have been joking, but when we took it very seriously within the school system and we, and we, and he's in never happened since. And is he joking? Is he not? But that's a, that's a serious threat. So yeah, you're right. There's, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of disbelief. And there's, I think a lot of times people might just say, well, it does happen maybe in other countries, but it's really not in our town. It's not within our church, we, or people think they already have maybe all the answers. I don't know, but I think fear is a big part of it. And people are scared to uncover uh, things, I think. Very Somehow. important. That's very important. We're gonna take a commercial break. We will be right back. Stay put. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back after this. <laughs>
wellness warriors. Welcome back to Fit Bites with Adriana. Today, we're diving into a topic that is often overlooked, but incredibly important, pelvic floor health. Pelvic floor is a group of muscles that support your pelvic organs. Keeping them strong and healthy is crucial for preventing issues like incontinence and pelvic pain. So what can you do to take care of your pelvic floor? Well, first, practice pelvic floor exercises, also known as Kegels. They help strengthen these muscles and can be done anywhere, anytime. Next, focus on your posture. Good posture takes the pressure off of your pelvic floor and helps it function properly. Mind your lifting technique. Always engage in your core and use your legs when lifting heavy objects to avoid straining your pelvic floor. Pay attention to your bathroom habits. Avoid straining during bowel movements and practice good bladder habits to keep your pelvic floor in tip-top shape. And lastly, don't ignore symptoms. If you experience any sign of pelvic floor dysfunction, like leakage or pain, seek help from a healthcare professional. By incorporating these best practices into your daily routine, you can maintain a strong and healthy pelvic floor. Stay tuned for more Fit Bites, and here's to your health from the inside on out. Welcome to E360 TV, the live streaming and on-demand destination for influential voices and enlightened audiences. We offer trending, grassroots, and purpose-driven content across a diverse range of interests. E360 TV is more than just watching programs. We offer the ability to interact with live shows connecting audiences to real, authentic influencers and storytellers while streaming to millions of devices. Real experiences. Raw conversations. One destination for it all. E360 TV. Welcome back to the Health Revolution. Welcome back, everybody. My guest today, Bobby Utaro, we are talking about the topic of overcoming sexual violence and the healing and the support that is important to surround that topic with. Uh, Bobby Utaro is a rape crisis counselor, community educator, and he is the author of To the Survivors. And Bobby, as we were going to break, you were talking about, you were sharing different areas about the concerns, the pushback, the uh, when, when it has come up and uh, the fear that is associated with what if we introduce this and so it clearly it's it's a challenge and i wanted to circle i, I wanted to come around to the topic of challenges and ask you what are some challenges that you have found that uh that survivors of sexual violence have do face and what are some ways in which it's important to help them overcome these challenges Many challenges. Um, many times this is life and death with some people just want, you know, the, the struggle to stay alive is real for many people. And same with people that have not been sexually abused. But um, what you do, you know, in your work with fitness and, and nutrition, there are many people struggling with eating and um, with control. And challenges of depression and anxiety and fear you know, uh, some of my, the people I work with, they, and I really, I can't help with this at all. It's the nightmares, the nightmares they have is, is brutal, uh, to a lot of people, the flashbacks, um, that anything can trigger them. And so being able to try to help with that, but also the self-esteem it's the, it's the self-esteem, the self-worth, the shame, the insecurity, the fear. And many people believe that they're so 
ugly and dirty and unhealthy and no one would want them. It is just so sad. It's part of the reason I continue to do this work. So how I can help with that is I try to meet them where they're at. And we really, to me, we, we really live in a world of truth and lies. And so there are many lies that people are affected with. There are many lies that people listen to, are being told, and being and they believe. So I try to combat that. I combat the lie. So if someone says, you know, I'm useless, I'm worthless, no, you're not, you're so worthy, here's how. And I can ex explain 30 different reasons as to why they're worthy and why they should stay on this earth. Um, so really trying to help and, and connecting them to the services that they might need. That could be therapy, that could be a coach like yourself, that can be movement and exercise is very important. It is it is very important for people's healing for their lives. So connecting them with someone like that, yoga, body work, even just getting a massage can be so scary and so important in one's own healing process, given their experiences that we often don't know, because this is often hidden in secrecy and shame. What are some of the elements of support in the mental health and the emotional counseling that you offer and that that's provided for those that you work with? What's beautiful about crisis centers is that there are people that some people believe that what they've experienced is, is they can't share it and that it's, it's so bad that no one will listen. It's, it, but it's not true. It's bad what happened to you. But there are people 24 hours a day. There are people that will pick up that phone 24 hours a day. There are people 24 hours a day that go to hospitals if anyone did choose to go to a hospital. There are um, the people will be out there and they will hear you. They, they really will. They really will. So, you know, just I don't know if I'm answering your question, just not suffering and taking this on alone is just very important, but it's so scary. It's just scary to reach out. It's scary to reach out for help, um, but it exists out there. So it's not just me. There are so many people that do this as well. Um, I would argue more people should do this. I, and if someone has the call, if someone has a feeling inside, don't let fear cripple you. Don't let fear deter you from doing that. Because if I did, I wouldn't be here with you today. So are there, are there uh, protocol steps that you that that you choose to take when when uh, when connecting with someone who is a survivor and then their family are there different uh, approaches to 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 connecting everyone together so that the healing process those who are who are supporting the survivor can experience it really depends because some people go to the hospital some people want to go to the police other people don't some people are looking for individual counseling sometimes significant others might call and they just want information for themselves so the protocol does vary um, depending on the need and where people are going for me personally the protocol is always spending time with them listening to them believing them and giving them all the time that they need and then depending on what comes out then going uh, trying to be a bridge to where they might need to go I want to circle around to your book and I, I want to see if we can bring up the slide. The book is called To the Survivors and talk uh, talk about how you made the decision to to write this book and then the framework that how it is, how it's meant to be received. Hmm. So the book came about through a dream. I just woke up from a dream and I opened up Microsoft Word, I wrote to the survivors. I had no idea how to write a book, no idea how long it would take, no idea how to do it, but I had a dream, had that dream, and I believed in it. I believe in this, I will believe in this throughout my whole life, and I just went for it. Um, the The framework, how people receive it, again, is is tough to say because there are some people who love it so much it's actually to some people it's one of if not the most important books in their life other people think it's awful so it's it's a mixed bag some people think it's okay some people think it's a really important topic but they wouldn't want to read it other people are would love to can, give it to you know maybe a family member but they don't know how that family member is going to take it how they're going to react to it so it's such a sensitive topic it's such a it's such a problem that affects so many people in different ways it's kind of challenging to say how someone will take it because 
it really is a mixed bag. One woman told me she actually was so angry with it. She was ripping up pages and throwing it, but that was actually helpful for her in her process. And um, she feels bad about it. I'm like, it's don't worry about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, it's just, a, it's a book. It, that's I ignited something in her, just her experiences. She was so angry, but uh, I've heard people keep it by their bedstand. And um, again, other people that want absolutely nothing to do with it. So it's, it's quite an interesting, um, interesting reactions, I would say. What year, when did you write it? So it took me a little under three years. I started in 2010 and it was published in 2013. Okay. And so what are some of the other feedbacks or what, what are some, what have you heard from others who have shared their, their thoughts about the book? I know you mentioned the one woman who just, you know, went into, she had that feeling and was ripping out pages, but what are some other, uh, what are some other opinions that you've heard from those who have, who have, uh, have any, anyone in your inner circle read the book? Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to caption the words. If people are really interested, even in what, you know, newspaper, uh, bloggers or, or customers, they could always read the comment sections, you know, go to amazon.com and read what people have said. For me, some people can't express what it really means to them. And I don't say that in a conceited way. I wish there wasn't even a need to write a book like that. Okay. But so I've had people just cry to me. I've had people hug me. I've had people thank me. Um, I've had people buy it for their significant others. Um, I've had, I've been, I was at a male conference for men and it was their female wives who were just bawling their eyes out because they just recently learned their husbands were sexually abused. So they are so appreciative of the work. I can't fully capture the appreciation for some people. Um, I just, I know it's out there sometimes, sometimes it's just a look. I'd be, I've been at book fairs throughout the United States and sometimes someone will just look at me in a certain way and then they'll keep walking. So um, lot, mostly positive, really uh, positive feedback. Uh, there are many people who think it is a, a well-written book. There are many people, it's raw though. It's, it's a raw book. It's, it's true stories. I mean, there are true stories of women, men, and one transgender man who have been raped and sexually assaulted. So, you know, it shows how it happened to them, how it affected them, but how they've come out of it. And it's all in their own words. I knew it had to do this, to, to, to write about this issue, you have to be real. And I wanted to give them the voice of themselves. And those are the people who chose to ultimately go through the process. I have a copy of the book right here. I'm grateful to have it. Uh, chapter 18, you you write here, or it is written, uh, False Unity. Um, sexual violence is a human problem, and we are not solving anything or even helping society as a whole if we only think sexual violence affects one gender. Talk a little bit more about that and how powerful this statement is for all of us to embrace. It's, it's a human problem. I would, I would argue it's a spiritual problem. And you, you said something earlier that made me think of it, you know, about my own a, a accomplishments or, or things I've learned in my career. It's been very important. I, I don't view this myself, but I've seen it in other people. People, specifically men and, and young people, have been very thankful and appreciative that a man is speaking on this. So I've had many women be thankful and love the fact that I do this work. And that's not to be, again, conceited. I'm just stating like facts. But there's been so many men who have really been moved. And many people would say it's a women's issue. I would argue it's more of a men's issue than women's because it's the majority of people committing the crimes are ultimately men. Again, it's a human problem. But that is, that's been, we can't look at this and just say it's one gender. And again, regardless of the gender or even identity or orientation, it affects people of all ages, of all ages. This is a, a, a horrific problem that has been in the world and sadly will continue to be in the world. And no matter where they come from, no matter what they've experienced, we should treat them with love, with, with love, with compassion, with empathy. And you can change a person's life. You can save a life by doing that. Don't blame them. Don't treat them poorly. And so many do. It's so difficult for people to talk about and they open up and then someone either doesn't believe them or treats them poorly or blames them, makes them feel even worse about themselves. They have no idea the power of their words. That's one more thing 
in my life that I've learned the power of our words. So if I just say one truthful thing that I've learned through other people and it connects, it has real power. It has a real impact on people's lives. And that is a blessing to me. So if I'm effective, I have a call to keep doing it. So you mentioned, you mentioned earlier that you spoke at a men's conference and the response from the women who were part of it mm -hmm. uh, was pretty profound. What was it like to, what was the response you, you received from men? Were they, was it initially re receptive? Was it uh, maybe a pause for thought? Maybe a, um, just you could, a, vi a visual processing of what everyone was experiencing. What was it, what was it like to, to lead a men's conference and, and discuss this? Hmm. I wasn't leading it. Part of my work is being a support, right? So, um, and, and there's, again, there's a range of these things. So I, one of the men that, some of the men that were speaking, we call them survivor speakers. So uh, one of my friends, he's actually in my book, his name is Jim, his chapter's in the book. Jim was abused as a kid by a priest, but he has gone his whole life. And now he's become so confident, so comfortable talking about these. He goes and travels and tells his story to people. And it's just, it's, it's, it's really intense to watch and witness and also to see the impact he has on people, right? Um, so there were a couple other men there. So the men, everyone in the room's thankful, but there were other men in there that are not even close to where Jim is. And in fact, they got one guy, I'll, 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 I'll never forget it. He was just so angry. And he got up there and he started screaming and he's like, I'm not surviving. I'm not driving. I'm none of that. And he's just so angry and that, but he's with people that can respond well, treat him with love. I have no idea where that man has gone in his life. I have no idea, but I hope and believe that that was an important part of his life. And maybe one day he'll go out sharing a story, maybe not. So men have been, there are so many men, there are men that commit these crimes and they continue to, but there's so many men that don't, there are so many men that are horrified that I keep using that word, but like, they're just horrified that this happens. I know a man who he learned his girlfriend was raped. It looked like the, nothing made sense to him anymore because someone he loves this happened to. And so he is so impacted. His life has now changed. So there are many men who would be great rape crisis counselors. There are some that do it. There are some, who would be excellent advocates. And again, they shouldn't be shunned. They shouldn't be told no, just because they're a man, which is something they don't even, they didn't have control over with how they were born. That doesn't speak to their heart and it doesn't speak to their love. So it's again, been a mixed bag, but overall a lot. Of, and even with our boys, like if I sadly have had to give trainings on rape jokes, some of our youth are making rape jokes and I don't think some of them understand what that even means. I think they just say it, they're just teenagers. Some of them are just being just dumb. But when I get up there and I start talking about them, they shut up. They're not rude anymore. They're not disrespectful anymore. They're hearing it. And that is special. I think, I think we need to have that more. We need to do that more for our young men. So do you think that because you being a man that it's making an impact versus, you know, say if a woman we're in the same situation and conveying the same message that it wouldn't land necessarily the same that if if a man is standing up to sexual violence and speaking against these things that um that just don't have a place the the jokes the all of that do you think that there's a subconscious impact that's that's happening I, to me it almost like shouldn't but it does to okay. people right like to me a boy whether you're 12 or 18 or 35, if a woman comes in here and talks to you about sexual assault, you should listen to her, okay? You shouldn't just, just because a man comes in, now all of a sudden you're getting it. Like, I don't think that should happen. However, in reality, it does for some of our people. There, it, there is, and, and there are women, there have been so many women who have opened up to me. They, sh they share with me their deepest and darkest secrets, their deepest and darkest experiences. And yet there are many women that don't open up to me at all. And that's totally fine. Right. So yeah, it does. It, I've seen it have an impact and if it works great, you know, so, you know, if, if teachers have brought me in and also just the experience, I think sometimes just sometimes people, you know, if you I could talk to you about police stats, 
but you're probably going to listen to someone who's a police officer more than me on certain elements of crime who's done the work as a cop, right? So I think to some people being a man and to some people just even being doing the work um, really gets them to listen. And, and the hope is that they really listen and accept it, right? I'm not telling people, you know, what to do with their bodies. I'm not telling people how to live their lives. I'm saying to you, this is a problem. Don't do this. And this problem has all these effects. And if you do this, you are doing that to someone and you might actually lead them down a path of suicide. Don't do that. We're going to take a break. Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back after this. Thank you so much for watching The Health Revolution. Our show is growing and it's all thanks to viewers like you. No matter how you found us, please hit the subscribe button so we can stay connected and continue to deliver amazing content to you. Life is so fragile and we're constantly reminded just how fragile life can be, especially when we or a loved one is told we have cancer. Cancer survivor myself, I can tell you, we still feel very alone in this journey. There's a study that's been shown that patients who are socially isolated have a worse prognosis, have a worse outcome than patients who are socially interconnected. Buddies for Life is a non-profit cancer support group for those whose life has been impacted by cancer. Humor, hope, heart, and hugs. Humor, hope, heart, hugs, and a whole lot of love. Share this with your friends and family and support this community in every way you can. No one should face cancer alone. I am a chemo buddy for life. We are a buddies network. No one does cancer alone. We are buddy. And we are all here for you as a community of love. We are chemo buddies for life. And if you've heard three words, you have cancer, for yourself or someone else, you belong with us at chemo buddies for life. Healing through connections. And now we want to give special thanks to Biomed Mobile IV for sponsoring the health revolution. Biomed Mobile IV is Colorado's top mobile IV therapy service servicing throughout the state of Colorado. They offer an array of vitamins and above and beyond safety preparation. Biomed Mobile IV, your dedication to health and wellness is exactly what our show is all about. And we thank you for your support. Welcome back to the health revolution. Welcome back everybody. My guest today, Bobby Utaro, he is the author of the book to the survivors. He is a community educator and a rape crisis counselor. And Bobby, as we were going to break, we we're talking about the, uh, the impact that, uh, that gender has had say in the case of, uh, boys or even men listening to a man stand up to sexual violence and how the subconscious, the subconscious impact that has. Um, what are some of the, what are some things that you cover in your workshops as you, as you conduct workshops and just share the message of how important this is, that this is on the forefront of our minds, the um, sexual violence, the, the support for survivors, and then options to continue the healing. A common theme in my trainings and workshops is that this happens, this is real, and there are uh, many negative effects to it, but that it's there's always hope and that people really do heal. It's, people really do recover. It does not have to cripple and control people. And that there's always someone out there that will listen, that they're not alone. Those are things I'm always touching upon in any of my trainings. A, a, a lot of trainings deal with consent. And, you know, I've had, I've had, I've had teachers say to me, I'm really worried about like those two, you know, because they're about to go into college next year. I'm like, okay. So like one of my goals is trying to just have a safe environment, but like not making people feel terrible for having sexual thoughts or sexual, you know, um, desires or even, even having sex. It's not my job. It's not what I do, but to make them understand the difference of, sex and sexual assault, the difference of sex and rape and what consent really is. And I teach it in different ways. The consent isn't just verbal 
And even someone could verbally say the word yes, but they really don't give consent. And you asked something earlier that just made me think of it, how many times, one of the challenges is I work with people, in my experience has been women who have ultimately said the word yes, even though they, they're not acknowledging how terrified they were in that moment. And they blame themselves and that's part of their inner tor turmoil. That's part of their what's keeping them down because they said the word yes. So part of consent workshops is that we communicate differently, right? We communicate with our words. We communicate with our eyes. We communicate with our face. We communicate with our bodies. So seeing consent in all those different ways, I think is necessary um, and helpful for people when they make their choices. One of the things that one of the experiences that you've had is if you've spoken in groups in one of them being the military. And so I'm curious to see if you can share your your experience and maybe the dialogue that came out of leading leading that conversation to that group and what were maybe some surprising, not surprising moments that that were the result of that. There are. Many people who really judge the military and, and I know rapes in the military have come out and people have been uh, discussed with the military. For me, the military were great to me. So I personally had a great experience with the United States military and I wish I talked to them more. I don't, I haven't had those opportunities, but when I was there, it was big on leadership and um, it was, it was a long time ago when I spoke to them, but it was teaching them about what does leadership really mean? You're in the military. I mean, you, you're, you're protecting our country and you're, they were all listening. They were all respectful. And one of the, uh, one of the leaders got up and he was so angry at some of the people in his group because he knows this has happened. And there was, there, there was something that you know, someone just banged on someone's door. They just walked in and they just walked in or, or smashed it open and ultimately assaulted a woman. And he was just so disgusted by that. And that's not what the United States military stands for. This is not who we are. So I really valued that man's anger and him getting up and speaking. So um, it was similar in all my trainings, again, uh, hitting on certain similar themes, but really showing, uh, talking about what leadership can be in the military and how we can be safe in the military and how we can treat people uh, in the military if these things occur. And sadly, some people, there are people in our lives that they're not being assaulted maybe in the military, but they might be coming into the military uh, with past experiences or really any job profession. So trying to be sensitive and, and thoughtful of people's pasts into their uh, current lives. Were there, were there moments when you spoke to the group where it was that there was even more clarity behind why conversations like this were important, that uh, that even in the group such as the military, that this was just the clarity behind the result of having this conversation was just ever apparent. I believe so. I, I believe, you know, I, I, working, like kids can be, you know, disrespectful or people can be challenging trying to teach something or middle school is really difficult to teach, you know, a health topic, right? But getting them to pay attention, it's like 95% of the battle. Right? If you can get like a teenager to just like, listen, you have a real chance to teach them something very important. So in my work with the trainings on rape and sexual assault, I don't have the disrespect really. I really have people sitting, listening, they take it seriously. Many people are scared. Again, you brought up fear earlier. They're scared of what's about to come. Um, whether they've been abused, they know someone's been abused, or maybe they're the ones committing assaults. So, or just not knowing what's going to come out. So, yeah, I think, you know, in my experience, we've had a lot of clarity. We've had a lot of, I, one of my best, or one of my important things to create a safe space. And maybe that phrase gets used lightly, but it really is true with this topic. And so bringing everyone into the, into the community, into the conversation. And I always allow free thought, just like today, you can ask anything and we'll see where it goes. So I think people really appreciate uh, that environment where free thought and questionings, even if you disagree with me, you can tell me how wrong I am. Just ask the question and let's have a respectful back and forth. And, and the responses have been overwhelmingly positive. Um, and again, sometimes disclosures come as a result of it. 
Absolutely. We're going to take a quick break. Stay put. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back after this. Hi, this is Clara Capato, your host for Women Winning Their Way, where we talk about how you can create success all on your terms. Join us Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Limelight Network here on E360 TV. to the health revolution. Welcome back, everybody. My guest today, Bobby Utaro, the author of the book, To the Survivors. We are talking about uh, the healing and the support that that is necessary for the experience of uh, sexual assault, sexual violence. And uh, one excerpt I just want to read, I know we are running out of time here, Bobby, but one was the uh, a quote from the beginning of chapter 10, and it says, justice. The most important thing is that there are absolutely options he- there. There are a lot of of different legal options that people might not know about. So it's great to talk to someone who can help them figure that out, but there is no right or wrong decision. There really isn't. It really is individual. Uh, I know we're, we're running out of time, but can you speak, can you just add to that uh, maybe an important message for all of us to know about, about that? Too many people try to tell people what to do and what they should do. And even in these experiences and don't do that because you don't know what they've been through you don't know what they're thinking you don't know how they're feeling and they're i most people don't actually want to go to the police and that's totally okay so that was an interview with a lawyer who is a rape crisis counselor who's an amazing human being and she is just incredible and so what what people can also change in the timeline so what what that kind of means is that's it if you choose to report to the police. If you choose down a path of the criminal justice system that will be there with you to support you, but here's how it looks like. This is what can happen. Is this what you wanna do? And you present present them with all the uh, facts of what could take place. And sometimes they do, and then over time they don't. There are some people who um, don't and they go, no. And then two years later, they want to. So it really varies. And it's important to let people know there's resources, there's options. Um, that you don't have to do something. And it's important to don't give out false information. So if you don't know the answer, don't say it, right? So I don't give people false legal information because if I don't know what I'm talking about, you're hurting them. I've had people freak out that they had only a certain amount of time to report, which just simply wasn't true. Um, but the justice chapter is, a, to me, a very important chapter. It's a different, what is justice and what does it mean? It's, it's, it's a legal question. It's a philosophical question. It's a spiritual question. It's what does justice mean to people? So I attempt to uh, to help people get justice for themselves. And that looks different to different people. So to some people, justice really is finding justice in the criminal justice system with a guilty uh, conviction. To other people, it is being able to sleep at night. So it really varies. Important, important distinction. Uh, Bobby, where are you on social media and then out there on the World Wide Web? Where can people find you for more information and support? You can find me at robbyutaro.com. Uh, send me an email. You can uh, check out the book if you want on my website or on amazon.com. It's uh, out there on, you know, uh, media outlets um, globally and check me out on Facebook, Twitter. I'm not on social media as much. I'm still, uh, I'm, I'm going to the next calling, Adriana. Um, you know, wherever uh, the next the next place that someone wants to have these conversations like this, uh, I'm deep, deeply thankful for and I deeply thank you uh, for this time and this uh, interview, I think it was very special. So uh, see where the world takes me. Yes, the book is called To the Survivors, Bobby Utaro. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate your time and energy and your wisdom. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
And for our viewers, of course, you know our website is thehealthrevolutiontv.com. You can find out more show information. You can also email us for any show topics that you'd love for us to cover, that we certainly can do so. And then in the upper left-hand corner, you're going to see a QR code. Feel free to grab that. That'll lead you to our website. And then, as always, we're on E360 TV on the Achieve TV channel, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. That is all the time we have. Thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, take care. We will see you soon.